series called Good Stuff from Exodus. We started last week in the middle of the story. We talked about the Passover narrative. And uh, now I want to take us back to the beginning of the story. In the beginning of the book, we're reminded that God is faithful to those who follow him. And the writer brings us up to speed with what has happened at the end of the book of Genesis. He reminds us that we're in the middle of a story about an extended family of people. And it all started with Abraham. God called Abraham, Abraham responded to God, and they started to have a relationship where God would speak to Abraham and lead him and guide him, and in return, Abraham worshiped God, and he did the things that God wanted him to do. He didn't always do it perfectly, he made mistakes, but in Abraham, we see a person who loves God and chooses to follow God, and as a result, God is faithful to Abraham and to his family. As we begin the book of Exodus, the story is about Abraham's grandson, Jacob, and his family. The first verse says, these are the names of the sons of Israel, that is Jacob, who moved to Egypt with their father, each with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. In all, Jacob had 70 descendants in Egypt, including Joseph, who was already there. So it began with Abraham and Isaac, and now Jacob and his family, and we see that when God is faithful, we are fruitful. God has chosen this family, they have responded to God, and God has blessed them. Look at this, in time Joseph and all of his brothers died, but their descendants, the Israelites, had many children and grandchildren. In fact, they multiplied so greatly that they became extremely powerful and filled the land. So God is being faithful to Abraham and to Jacob and to Joseph, and he blesses their family for many, many generations. Now the span of time here is probably about 430 years, and God is blessing them over many generations. And what a great reminder this is to us that when you are faithful to God, God blesses you, but it's not only about you. It's about your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. That blessing will pass along to many generations. And some of you have spiritual children. Maybe you don't have kids of your own, but you have invested in many other people and been like a spiritual mother or a spiritual father to them. And none of that is for nothing. Everything that you do as a parent, as a youth leader, as a children's ministry leader, as a mentor, as a Bible study leader, everything you do, God is able to take and use it, and your faithfulness is going to bless many generations. We get caught up in the moment. Sometimes we say, oh, it doesn't matter you know, if I really pass on my faith in this moment. It doesn't matter if I don't help to make disciples in this moment, but it does matter. God will take your faithfulness today and he will use it as a blessing to the next generation. And that's what we see here. The Israelites are blessed because of the faithfulness of those who came before them. But if we look closely at the story, we begin to notice that something is missing. What is missing? Well, in Genesis, every time Abraham is blessed by God, every time Isaac is blessed, Jacob is blessed, Sarah is blessed, every time God does something good in their lives, What do they do? They stop and they pray, and they stop and they build an altar in that place, and they worship God. But here we read that they are blessed beyond measure, but there's no mention that they're praying or that they're worshiping God like there was in Genesis. Maybe you've stopped praying. Maybe they've stopped praying. Doesn't that happen to us sometimes? Things are going great. God is blessing us, college is going well, you got into the program that you wanted, your family's doing great, the kids are healthy, work is going well. What happens when we experience a season of blessing? Well, so many times we stop praying and we stop uh, calling out to God. We prayed so hard when life was more difficult or our parents prayed so hard for us when life was more difficult, but now we're in a season of blessing and we've stopped calling out to God and we've stopped praising God, and we've stopped worshiping God. It happens all the time, and maybe that's what's happening here in this story. And then their blessings turn into burdens because the number of Israelites becomes so large that the Egyptians begin to distrust them. Exodus says, eventually a new king came into power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph or what he had done. He said to his people, look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. 
We must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. If we don't, and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us, and then they will escape our country. Wow, crazy stuff here. The entire nation is rising up against the Israelites, and still, they're not praying. No prayer is happening yet. The Egyptians made their lives bitter. They were afraid of this large group of foreigners in their midst, so they made the Israelites their slaves, and they appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. They forced them to build the cities of Pithom and Ramses as supply centers for the king. The Egyptians worked the people of Israel without mercy, and they made their lives bitter, forcing them to mix mortar and make bricks and do all of the work in the fields. They were ruthless in all of their demands. Once again, still no mention of prayer. How bad does it have to get before they start to pray? Then the Egyptians order Hebrew midwives to kill their boys. Then Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, gave this order to the Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua. When you help the Hebrew women as they give birth, watch as they deliver. If a baby is a boy, kill him. If the baby is a girl, let her live. Still no mention of prayer. Finally, the Egyptians kill the boys themselves because the Hebrew midwives refuse to do this. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all of his people, throw every newborn Hebrew boy into the Nile River, but you may let the girls live. How bad does it have to get before we pray? Here we see generations of this family, not one mention of them praying. Prayer is absent from their story. Here's my first question, is prayer absent from your story? What would God do if we all devoted ourselves to pray? When people pray, relationships get turned around, faith gets ignited, and problems become opportunities for God to show his power. Hezekiah prayed and 15 years were added to his life. Elijah prayed and he saw a little boy healed. He saw a drought ended. In the book of Acts, the earliest Christians prayed some bold prayers that led to thousands of people coming to Christ. But when people don't pray, Don't you think the opposite is true as well? That when people don't pray, relationship patterns get stuck in in a pattern of bitterness and disappointment. Some of us are stuck in a pattern like that right now. When people don't pray, churches get stagnant and eventually have to close their doors. When we don't pray, problems start to feel overwhelming to us. I remember one time I was a youth leader at a big youth conference and the doors We're just about to open. Hundreds of high school students were going to walk in the room. We were going to lead them in worship. We were going to share the gospel, and hopefully some of them were going to make life-changing decisions that would change their future, and suddenly the sound system failed. 30 minutes before we were about to open the doors, and we tried everything. Tried every solution to fix the problem. Nothing worked. Five minutes before we were about to open the doors, somebody said, hey, maybe we should pray. (laughs) And so we prayed. And within minutes of praying, one guy, the solution came to him as we were praying. And he tried it and it worked. Problem solved. Hundreds of students walked in and God showed up. Now God doesn't give us everything that we pray for. And I realize a sound system sounds trivial. It's a small and trivial problem compared to some of the problems maybe that you're facing. But God is big enough to respond to the small things and the big things in our lives. And my point is this, that whenever we're faced with a problem in life, be it a small problem like a technical issue or something at work or a big problem like a struggling relationship, sometimes we forget to pray and to bring that situation before God and ask for his help. Why is that? We get stressed, we get anxious, we go online, we try to find an answer to our problem, but what if we prayed I'm not talking about a short prayer here, or I'm not talking about a uh, Lord, I lay me down to sleep prayer. I'm talking about sitting before God on a regular basis and making your requests known. I can't promise you that God is going to answer every prayer the way that you want him to. I can't answer that God is going to promise you that God is going to answer every prayer in the timeline that you want him to. But I can promise that 100% of the prayers that you don't pray won't get answered. Let me repeat that. 100% of the prayers that you don't pray won't get answered. In other words, what do you have to lose by praying about something? 
One of the greatest tragedies in life is the prayers that go unasked. James says this, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. You see, we think there's all sorts of reasons that God isn't showing up in our life, but here's the main reason. You've, you haven't stopped and asked God and prayed about it. Jesus said it this way, if you're a parent, you can relate to this. He said, if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? I remember one Christmas, our kids wanted the Nintendo Wii. It was the latest game console. We saw it at Cross Iron Mills Mall in Calgary. The kids tried it out. It was all they could talk about. It was all they could ask for. This looks so cool. We could have so much fun with this. And they kept asking us with a persistence that was annoying most of the time. Mom, Dad, we need to get the Wii. This thing is so cool. We'll have so much fun with it. And there's something inside of every father and every mother that wants to give, give good gifts to your kids. Until Jesus says, if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give you good gifts? That's the heart of the father. He wants to give good gifts. He wants to be in relationship. He wants to bless his children. So that's my first question. Is prayer absent from your story? Second observation here is that sometimes what we call God's plan is really our inaction. We all wanna say, well, God has a plan. And usually when we say something like that, it's not because things are going great, it's because things are not going so great. And sometimes it's just a way of bringing comfort to each other and encouragement to each other. Well, well there's this big master plan here and we don't understand what's, got, what, what's going on here, but God has a plan. But we have to step back and go, does he have a plan like this, though? Like in Israel's situation, does God really have a plan where he's going to enslave his people and his, their sons are going to get murdered? No, that's not God's plan. That's not God's heart. And we think this way about ourselves sometimes. Something terrible happens to us. We don't understand it, but we will trust in his plan. And it's easy to just go in that direction because then we don't have to press in and pay attention to anything that got us into the predicament in the first place. And we can just say, well, it's all part of God's plan. And so we have the ultimate excuse. Whatever we navigate ourselves into, it's not our fault. It's God's fault. He has a plan. And we're not culpable. It's part of God's plan. So when it comes to prayer, sometimes we say, what will be, will be. This is all just part of God's plan. God will figure it out. Meanwhile, we're in spiritual bondage, or a family member is in spiritual bondage, and we're refusing to pray because we're like, well, it's what God wanted. I can't do anything about it. God has a plan. The thing is, that means God is to blame for everything, and I don't think it's a stretch. I think we would all agree that God's plan is about redemption. God's plan is to put things back together God's plan is to make all things new. And he wouldn't need to have that plan if things weren't broken. And they got broken somehow. So if we come back to our own lives here, instead of making it global or cosmic, God's plan is to put together what is broken in us. His plan is redemption. And he wouldn't need to put things back together if we had no brokenness. And how did that happen? How much of what we would consider to be our brokenness is the choices and the decisions that we have made to not cooperate with God in the process of redemption. Instead, being our own guide and our own sovereign and then navigating where we want to go and then so often blaming God for where we end up because he has a plan. Well, he has a plan, but so do we. And we get to choose whether we're on board with God's plan or we're trying to get him on board with our plan. Maybe whatever's happening in your life right now, maybe it isn't God's plan, but instead God is waiting for you to pray. Maybe he is waiting for you to ask him to do something. And that's what is interesting about Israel's story here. They have success, but then they stop praying. And trouble starts just a little bit, but they don't start praying. Trouble ramps up even more. Still no praying. It's like, well, I guess this is what God wanted. No, 
God does not want you to live in bondage. God does not want you to live in slavery. God's plan is redemption. God's plan is to set you free. God's plan is to help you through those tough times. That is God's plan. We have two ministries starting up this week. Maybe you need to be a part of one of these. Maybe you're in bondage in a drug or an alcohol addiction. And it's not God's plan for you to stay there. We're offering up this support group for anyone who's interested. Maybe you're struggling managing your emotions and you can see that this has become an area where you need help and where you need support. We're offering a course on Monday nights taught by health professionals that can help you to do this. You don't have to stay stuck. God's plan is for you to be able to move forward. All it takes is for you to take a step, a bold step, a courageous step into one of these groups and you will see God start to bring to you that breakthrough that you've been waiting for. Finally, at the end of the second chapter of this book, the Israelites, they get so desperate, they call out to God. After many years of slavery, the people call out to God for help. Look at the text. Years passed, years passed, and the king of Egypt died, but the Israelites continued to groan under their burden of slavery. They cried out for help, and their cry rose to God. I would have loved to have seen God's face in that moment. You know, God respects our will. God does not invade our space. God waits for us to invite him in. I mean, yes, God invaded our space when he sent Jesus to die for our sins, to redeem us, to set us free. But when it comes to your personal decisions over your life, God takes the position that he is calling you and he is calling out to you saying, I am here. I want to help you, but you have to want the help. You have to want to be set free, and God knows that. You have to want it. So God waits, and finally Israel calls out for help, would have loved to have seen God's face in that moment. Finally, they begin to pray. What happens when we pray? The text says, God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God looked down on the people of Israel, and knew it was time to act. I love these verses. They tell us four things about what God does when we start to pray. First of all, God hears your groaning. God's ear is close to the ground. He is listening to your cry. He's listening to your call for help. And God is there ready to meet you where you're at. God hears your groaning. You maybe lost a child. Some of us have lost a child in recent months. God hears your groaning. God, God's ear is attentive to your cry. God knows what you're going through. You have a child or you have a parent who is struggling with addiction and that addiction has finally got so bad that they're in serious trouble. You have some, someone that you care about and they're facing a health crisis and they need healing. God hears your cry. God hears your prayer. God hears your groaning. But look at this, Israel prays, and it's gonna take 40 years for God to prepare the way for the answer. So the answer is not always gonna come right away. It will take some time. God has to prepare Moses to lead them out. God has to set things up for their deliverance. But God has heard their cry. If you start to cry out to God and you don't get an answer right away, don't give up, keep on praying. Keep on bringing that situation before the Lord because just as God heard the cry of his people in this story in Exodus, God has heard your cry or God will hear your cry. Second thing that happens when we pray, God remembers his covenant with you. God answers their prayer because of his covenant with them. This doesn't mean that God had just totally forgotten about them. It isn't like, oh, I'm, I'm hearing a prayer. Where is it coming from? Oh, what is it? Oh, it's these people again. I forgot all about them. You know, last time it was a famine and they were in famine and they needed my help and I brought them to Egypt and I, I saved them from famine. But I'd forgotten all about them. Wonder what they're up to. Slavery? No way. I didn't know they were being held as slaves. Firstborn children being murdered? Wow, I didn't know that was happening. It's not like God is unaware that all this is happening. They, God knew it all. But God did not intervene until they prayed. What does that tell us about prayer? tells us God will let us find our way into our own messes in life. 
He has given us the ability to make choices, and sometimes we end up in a mess as a result of our choices or as a result of the choices of others. In this case, the Israelites are in a mess because of the Egyptians, because they were afraid of the Hebrews and they enslaved them. It wasn't God that did this. It was the Egyptian leaders who did this, but God, for some reason, is content to let the Hebrews live in slavery until they call out to him and ask God to act on their behalf. So the question is this, what do you want? What do you want for your life? You may be enslaved because of your own choices. You may be enslaved because of the choices of others, like the Israelites were. But God is there. God is listening. God is ready to act on your behalf. What do you want? There's power in prayer. Notice the third thing that happens here is God turns his face towards you with concern. The prayer in Exodus is saying, God, we want to be on board with your plan of redemption in our lives. We want to see your power at work in our lives. We're tired of living like slaves. We're tired of being in bondage. We need you, God. We need you. And we see here that God wants relationship. We're going to see this in the book of Exodus. It's actually a story about relationship that God wants to have with his people. So so God is there. He is powerful to act. He is ready to act. But he waits for the other party to say yes to the relationship. And it all starts with a prayer. It all starts when they cry out to God with a, a cry from their heart. It would have been great if they had called out to God when things were going well. It would have been great if they had called out to God just when the trouble was first starting. That would have been better for them, but they waited until they were in slavery, until their sons were being murdered before they called out to God. Even still, it's not too late to call out to God. It's better always to start before things get really bad, but it's still not too late. Final thing that happens when we pray is God looks down and says it's time to act. And he sets the plan in motion to free his people from slavery. Let's not make prayer our last resort. There should be a rhythm to your life where it's prayer and then action. Prayer and then take some action. Some people pray for a new job, then sit around and watch Netflix all day and wonder why they didn't get that new job. That's not gonna do a lot of good for you. But equally harmful is the mindset that says, I'm going to figure this out on my own. And then if that doesn't work, I'll try prayer. You don't try God, you worship God. In fact, there should be some triggers in or cues in your mind that tell you, you know, I should pray about this. What are those triggers? Things like stress and anxiety and worry and fear. If you're experiencing any of those in your life, That should be your cue. I need to pray. Prayer reveals what you really trust. Philippians 4, 6 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank him for all that he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. The Bible says, don't worry about anything. You say, I don't know if that's actually going to happen because I worry about a lot of things. Great. Then you ought to be praying about a lot of things as well. Fear, stress, anxiety. Those are not the result of God's will for your life. Those are the result of living in a fallen and a broken world. However, some of the most godly people that I know are people who have struggled with anxiety and worry for their whole life, but they've learned to use that as a cue to pray. They've learned to use that as a trigger to make God their first resort and not their last resort. Prayer reveals what you really trust. Israel trusted in their wealth. They trusted in their success. They trusted in their family history, but that trust failed them. What do you trust in? You may be tempted to trust in your money. You may be tempted to trust in your job or your friends or your kids' achievements. In whom or in what do you turn to when things aren't going very well? I love what Tim Keller says. He says that prayer is faith become audible. There's a time when Dallas Seminary was facing bankruptcy. They held a prayer meeting. One of the professors stood up and prayed out one of the Psalms. And he says, God, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. So sell some of them and give us the money (laughs) so we can keep the school open. Secretary came in after that meeting, 
gave them a note that a $10,000 gift would have been 100000 in today's money, had just come in. President turned to, to his, this professor and said, Harry, God sold some cattle. <laughs> well, God has a sense of humor because the money actually came from a Texas cattle rancher who sold two loads of cattle to give them that gift. Let me ask you, how big is your God? Is God big enough to heal that relationship? You think that relationship just feels broken? It would take a miracle for God to heal this. Is God big enough to heal that relationship? Is God big enough to heal your child? Is God bigger than your positive MRI results or your negative evaluation at work? Is he bigger than your biggest sin or bigger than your biggest hopes and dreams? One of the questions that God will ask to any one of us is, there, is this, is there any limit to my power? Is there any limit to what I can do in your life? I'm telling you this, God is bigger than your biggest problem. He's bigger than your biggest dream. His grace is bigger than your biggest sin. Is there anything in your life that's too hard for God? Jeremiah says this, O sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth by your strong arm and strong, strong hand and powerful arm. Nothing is too hard for you. There's not a problem, there's not an issue, there's not a sin in your life that is too hard for God. But don't take my word for it. You need to taste it for yourself. I have this uh, candy here. Bought it on my way in because this is my favorite candy. I don't eat a lot of sugar anymore, but when I do have a sugar urge, this, I stop. There's only like three gas stations in the city that sell these. This is like Sweet 16 Wild Strawberry. Anybody ever tried these before? Sweet 16 Wild Strawberry. These are so good. You put them in your mouth and they just melt in your mouth. They taste so good. I could, you know, I love my wife. I love my kids, but I hide these when I buy them. <laughs> like, it's always a different hiding spot in the house every time because they find them, right? I could tell you how great these are. I could read you the top three ingredients, which are glucose syrup, sugar, and modified cornstarch. Aren't those all like sugars? They're all, there's all this like versions of sugar. I could tell you that some of the ingredients in here are used to remove rust. Uh, some of them are used to make alkaline batteries. Some of them are used to, as a detergent to clean things, but that would still not tell you how great these taste when you put them in your mouth. And that's the way in life, there's some things you can know rationally, but you won't ever experience them in your own life until you try it. Prayer is how you taste God for yourself. You can hear other people talk about the power of God in their life, you can hear stories about how God moved in people's lives in a powerful way, you can hear me talk about it, but there's nothing compared to experiencing the power of God moving in your own life until you pray, you'll know that rationally, but you will not know that experientially until you taste the power of God in your own life. Psalm 34, it's a great invitation that says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. That's my invitation for us today. Would you just taste? Would you just taste and see that the Lord is good? Would you begin to pray and see that God is good in your life. I want to invite up the worship team. I want to close with a time of worship and a time of prayer and just a time of response. You see, God's plan is not to redeem, God's plan is to redeem us, not to see us fail. God's plan is to redeem us, not to see us fail. This is what Timothy Keller says. He says, God will give you what you would have asked for if you knew everything that he knows. Sometimes when we ask God for things, we end up, we're asking him for something we think is good, but it might end up being a scorpion to us. And God's not going to give us a scorpion. God's going to give us good things. So God will give you what you would have asked for if you knew everything that he knows, but he just wants us to come and ask him. Would you stand with me as we close the service? And I just want to invite you, if you have a burden on your heart, that's a burden for you and it's something you've been praying for and you wanna keep praying for, if it's something you have not started to pray for, but this morning God is saying, I need you to start to pray. 
because I'm not gonna move until you pray, until you start to call out to me and ask me. If you have a burden that's on your heart for somebody else, for healing, for recovery, for whatever situation they're going through, and you've been praying about that many times, come and pray. If God's been leading you to start praying because you haven't been praying, come and pray. Just as the team leads us in singing, good, good father, just come and pray. If your knees aren't great, you wanna sit in the front row, just sit in the front row. If you wanna come and kneel, if you wanna come and stand with your arms wide open, let's just pause and let's bring those needs to God. Would you join me? bring to you what our need is. God, I pray for those of us in this room right now who are calling out to you for something that's related to ourselves. It might be physical healing. It might be an addiction. It might be a struggle that we haven't told anybody about. It might be challenge walking through and dealing with our, with our emotions. And it just feels like we're stuck. And God, we're calling out to you and we're inviting you to come in and we're asking that you would hear our groaning, that you would hear our cry, dear Father, and that your heart would just turn towards us, that you'd remember your covenant with us and that you would begin to act on our behalf. Pray for those situations where we're praying for somebody else. We're praying for that healing. We're praying for their brokenness. We're praying for their addiction and recovery. We're praying, Lord, that you would come and that you would hear us. I pray for all of those needs, all of those situations, God, I pray that you would hear our hearts cry for this friend, for this neighbor, for this son, for this parent, that you would hear our hearts cry and that you would hear that covenant that we have, that relationship that we have, and that you would answer our prayer. We thank you, Lord, that as you hear our cry, you're beginning to act. You're beginning to act on our behalf. 
might take time before we see that fully come to completion. Help us to be faithful, to not stop praying, but to keep making prayer a part of our story. We thank you, God, for what you're going to do and already doing. We bless you. We praise you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. If you want further prayer, we have a team in the prayer room that would love to pray for you if you want to pray more with somebody. Uh, Now may God bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you and give you his perfect peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, amen. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you again next week. Take care.